Good morning. Thank you, Dr. York, for that introduction. It's a delight to be here at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary's chapel again. The last time I was here was in, the, was in March of 2020, and the day after I spoke, a pandemic hit. <laughs> Southern Seminary was shut down. The world stopped spinning. The sun refused to shine, and the sky fell on our heads. <laughs> disaster. I hope no such disaster overtakes us this time. <laughs> if it does, I'm sunk. I won't get another invitation to this chapel ever again. <laughs> Talking of disasters, I would like for us to turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 5 and look at two disasters back to back, Mark chapter 5. And as you negotiate your way to that section of Scripture, let me invoke the presence of God upon our gathering again. Our Father, would you send your Holy Spirit in special measure, the same Holy Spirit who inscripturated this word into our hearts for his illumination so that we may learn how to cope with disasters as we walk in discipleship with your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Eli Wiesel, Nobel Peace Prize winner whose writings have focused on the Jewish Holocaust and its atrocities was himself imprisoned by the Nazis at the age of 16. He endured unspeakable horrors at Auschwitz and Buchenwald concentration camps. One incident, he writes, lives forever in his memory. Two adults and a child, maybe 12 years old, had been caught holding guns and armaments inside the camp. They were sentenced to death. The boy had a refined and beautiful face, so different from the gaunt, disfigured faces of most prisoners, the face of a sad angel, Whistle writes. The guards erected three gallows. The three victims mounted chairs and nooses were placed around their necks. All the other prisoners were forced to line up and watch this gruesome spectacle. Long live liberty, cried the two adults. The child said nothing. But from the rows of anguished spectators, a cry came up. Where is God? Chairs were tipped over, and the bodies jerked, and then dangled limply from the ropes. It was a terrible sight. The two adults died in seconds, but the child, being so light, the third rope was twitching for over 30 minutes. Behind me, says Weasel, I heard the same man asking, where is God now? I hope you are never ever in the situation of witnessing or experiencing such abominable evil. But I bet there have been times in your life where you have asked that same question. Where is God now? Maybe there are some of you asking that today. Life is crumbling around you and there is no help in sight. No, not even God. 
a skewed EKG, a suspicious mammogram, an ominous call from the doctor's office. You or a loved one afflicted with disaster. Diseases and death always hovering around us. Even this community has had its share. And I personally have had mine. I lost a parent 10 months ago. Not to mention our entire nation, 650,000 deaths within the last two years. And when these disasters strike your life, and make no mistake, if they haven't already, they will. Where will you turn? How will you cope with these disasters? Let's find out how to do so from an inspiring account in Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43. Mark 5, 21 through 43. Mark 5, 21 through 43 is actually two stories, two disaster stories in sandwich form. Yes, a sandwich. Mark loves these sandwiches. He starts a story, cuts it off in midstream, starts a second story and finishes it, then comes back to the first one and completes that. Kind of like a burger, half a bun, patty, and then the other half of the bun. I prefer that to a sandwich. There are six of these burgers, at least, in the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> six of them. Our text is one today. You will catch it as we go along. But here's a story in brief. Jairus, a synagogue official, asks Jesus to come to his house to heal his dying daughter. Jesus sets off with him, but on the way, a woman with a bleeding problem surreptitiously touches his cloak and is instantly healed. Jesus stops, acknowledges the woman, and blesses her faith. Right then, word comes from Jairus' house that his daughter has died. It's too late. Jesus exhorts Jairus to have faith. They all arrive at his house. Jesus takes the little girl by the hand, and she comes back to life. Two amazing stories, one within another. Burger. I'll start at verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered before him, and he was by the sea. And one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came and, seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, that you may lay hands on her, that she may be healed and live. So Jairus is a leader in the synagogue. He is prominent. He's in the upper class. He lives in Anchorage. He's a lifelong Kentuckian, well-known in the community. Only one problem. His daughter, who, by the way, goes to Louisville Collegiate, is dying. He has everything in life, but his child is terminal. The situation is hopeless disaster. And then there's the woman. She's been dying a slow death by bleeding, likely a gynecological problem, 25, Mark 5, 25. And a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years and having suffered much under many physicians and having spent all that she had and was not being helped, but rather was becoming worse, Notice the relentless progression of her condition that describes the hopelessness of her state. Suffered much, seen by many doctors, spent all, much, many, all, only to get worse. For 12 years, she too is hopeless. Socially outcast, perhaps unable to be a mother, rejected, ritually unclean, living death. Disaster. The terrors of death are ever present. All kinds of disasters threaten. Diseases galore. Hospitals and doctors currently use a system of about 18,000 
codes to describe medical services in bills that we send to insurers so that we can get paid. Apparently, 18,000 wasn't enough for administrators. Recently, a new federally mandated version was introduced called ICD-10 for International Classification of Diseases, version 10, that expanded the number of disease codes from 18,000 to 140,000, adding codes that precisely describe what the medical condition is, was, and how it came about. There are codes for injuries in opera houses, injuries in art galleries, injuries in squash courts, and even codes for injuries in a chicken coop. There are separate codes for being bitten by a turtle and being struck by a turtle. <laughs> oh, and if you walk into a lamppost for the first time, the code is W22.02XA. Of course, if you are foolish enough to do it again, it's W22.02XD, walked into lamppost subsequent encounter. And then there's V9107XA4, burns due to water skis on fire. <laughs> but my favorite, my favorite is R46.1 for bizarre personal appearance. One of these days, I'm going to build someone for R46.1. <laughs> You know, someone somewhere is raking up our precious taxpayer dollars to come up with this stuff. I don't know. But I know this. Disasters are everywhere. All kinds of injuries and diseases, potential death looms over us. It doesn't take much. A drunken driver. A lightning strike. A riptide could be you. A swimming pool without a gate. A madman with a gun could be your child. And so here's Jairus, hopeless, and there's the woman, hopeless. Disaster, what did they do? Where do they go? And when it hits us, what do we do? Where do we go? There are two little cameos of unfaith in this sandwich, kind of like <clears throat> bits of comic relief in an otherwise serious story of death. I like to think of them as pickles in the burger that make you pucker. Here's the first pickle, verse 30. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power went out from him when the woman touched him, turned in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing on you and you say, who touched me? Dude, we've got a thronging crowd in here. You want to know who touched you? The irony of this account is that though Jesus knows who touched him, and that the woman knows she touched him, and we the readers know that the woman touched him, it's only those ingenuous and naive disciples that are ignorant. All kinds of people are touching you, Jesus. So what's the stuff about who touched me? They don't know Jesus, do they? They don't know of his sensitivity or his compassion. They don't know of his love, his care, his mercy. Nope. They don't. They have no faith. Already in Mark's gospel, he has stilled a storm, cured a demoniac, but the disciples are still faithless, stuck in disbelief. That's the first comic interlude. And later, when J Jesus gets to Jairus' house, he tells the mourning crowd that the little girl is not dead, only asleep. Verse 39. And entering, he said to them, why create a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but sleeps. And they began ridiculing him. Who is this madman who thinks the girl is only sleeping? This guy must be crazy. No, they don't know Jesus either, do they? They don't know his omnipotence. They don't recognize that he is God. They don't know that he is the one who gives life. They are just like the disciples. No faith, disbelief. Several years ago, a guy called Randy Reed, a 34-year-old construction worker, was welding on top of a nearly completed water tower outside of Chicago. 
Reed unhooked his safety gear to reach for some pipes when his metal cage slipped, bumped the scaffolding on which he stood. Scaffolding tipped, Reed lost his balance, fell 110 feet down, falling face down on a pile of bricks. Fellow worker called 911. Paramedics arrived, they found Mr. Reed conscious, moving, and miraculously only complaining of a sore back. And as paramedics carried him on a back boat to the ambulance, Reed had only one request. Don't drop me, don't drop me. <laughs> the guy falls 110 feet down and survives. God has solved our eternal problem of sin. And this guy is still nervous about three foot heights. We are nervous about temporal disasters. Mark is telling us, don't, don't, don't be like them. Those disciples or those ignorant, faithless bystanders. Instead, it is obvious who Mark wants us to emulate. Faithful Jairus and especially that faith-filled woman. Jairus had faith. He faced three challenges and overcame all of them by faith. First, he had a dying daughter. He knew only Jesus could heal her, and so he came to him. Faith. Second, there was a delay on the way caused by a woman who dared to touch Jesus. Can you imagine that? It's like being in an ambulance with your daughter on the way to the ER in 64 and 71 and 65. They're all shut down. The ambulance is stuck. It's going nowhere, delayed. But Jairus doesn't give up. He stays with Jesus. Faith. And in his third challenge, Jairus gets a phone call. Well, something like a phone call, verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why still bother the teacher? And then what does Jairus do? Verse 36. But Jesus, overhearing the word that was spoken, said to the synagogue official, don't be afraid. Only believe or only have faith. And at the urging of Jesus, Jairus goes home with him after hearing that his daughter had expired. Faith. Now, Jairus had faith all right. But the woman with the hemorrhage, she's the one to watch out for here. The paragon of faith and the exemplar of discipleship. Jesus even uses her as a model for Jairus, 34 and 35. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be made whole from your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why still bother the teacher? While he was speaking, they came saying. Just as Jesus applauds the woman's faith, Jairus gets the text message that his daughter has died. Verse 36, but Jesus Overhearing the word that was spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid, only believe, have faith. And those two verses, 35 and 36, are placed in such close proximity, almost picture in picture, that Jesus was probably pointing to the woman as he assured Jesus, Jairus, don't be afraid. Did you see what just happened? Only believe, have faith. And so these two stories in the sandwich are linked together. But there is another stronger link. Jump down with me to 542. 542. And immediately the little girl got up and began to walk around for she was 12 years old. She was 12. Guess how many years the woman with the hemorrhage had been suffering? Verse 25. And a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. One was 12 when she died. The other had been dying for 12 years. And she just got healed. And Jesus says, Jairus, you saw that. You saw her 12-year-long disease healed. Only believe, Jairus, for your 12-year-old. Only believe. Have faith. And the Holy Spirit through Mark's, Mark tells us to have faith. Be desperately dependent on Jesus in faith when stricken with disaster. But I tell you, this woman, she is something else. 
She is the ultimate model of a faith-filled follower of Jesus in this text. Look at the subtleties of her story. Verse 27. Hearing about Jesus coming in the crowd behind touched his garment. Behind. Now you might wonder, what's so remarkable about that? She was coming up to Jesus covertly. That's why she was behind him. Yes, of course. But another word closely related to the Greek one is almost always used by Mark in his gospel to denote the position of the disciple, the follower of Jesus. The disciple is always behind Jesus following him. Listen to this in Mark 1, 17 and 20. And Jesus said to them, follow me. It's literally come behind me and I will make you fishers of men. They left their father Zebedee on the boat and followed, which is went behind him. And Mark 8, 34, if anyone wishes to come after, it's actually behind me. He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so with this woman's location coming up behind Jesus, we have the first hint, albeit subtle, that this woman is the disciple we must emulate. Not only is she in the right position, she displays praiseworthy faith, 534. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be whole from your affliction. Others are called children by Jesus in Mark's gospel. But only this woman is called daughter. No one else in the gospel gets the privilege of being called daughter, or for that matter, son, by Jesus. Only this one. This lady has become part of the family of Jesus. She has become a daughter to God, impurity removed, status restored, rendered whole. And did you notice, with that label, daughter, there are now two daughters in this burger. Two patties. One daughter had a powerful father to work on her behalf to summon Jesus to her bedside. Jairus, the leader of the synagogue with lots of servants. The other daughter, this penniless woman, had no one to speak for her. She had no champions. She was the lowest of the low, no one to fight for her, no one to refer her to Jesus, no one to bring her to him, but Jesus calls her daughter. Henceforth, he would be her champion. He would fight her for her, for now she was his daughter. She who was at the bottom of the social scale, one who intruded upon Jesus important mission on behalf of the daughter of someone on the top of the social ladder, this lowly woman who dared breach protocol by touching Jesus when unclean, she had now become the daughter at the center of the story. Jesus cares even for the simplest and seemingly insignificant of his followers. Cares enough to stop. Cares enough to see the disaster, cares enough to call her daughter. Our God, the one who loves, the God who stops for the unimportant, the God who looks upon the stricken. And this woman believed in such a God. She, in faith, was utterly dependent on Jesus when stricken with disaster. And that's why she is the paragon of discipleship. I don't know what disaster you have been stricken with this year. Perhaps you are in between disasters. Perhaps you haven't had one recently. If so, it's only a matter of time. Our frail human situation is fraught with disasters. Death and disease will soon be upon us. It's just a matter of time. Do you know Jesus cares? 
Will you be utterly dependent on Jesus when it happens? Will you be his son, his daughter, demonstrating faith like this woman did? Of course, it starts with placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior from sin. But it goes beyond that. It's a continuing, ongoing, living faith in Jesus all our lives, utterly dependent on him when stricken with disaster like this woman. And there's more to this incredible lady. 526, and having suffered much under many physicians, suffered. In all of Mark's gospel, this verb to suffer is only used of two people, this woman and Jesus. Here's Jesus in 831, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Of no one else in the entire gospel is this word used. Only of Our Lady and Jesus. Mark is deliberately portraying her as close to Jesus. She is the paragon of discipleship because she follows his footsteps behind him. She is suffering as she follows him just like her Lord. And Mark isn't finished yet. Look at 529. And immediately her fountain of blood dried up and she knew in her body that she had been healed from her affliction. And here's that word again in 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be whole from your affliction. The Greek word for affliction also means to scourge or to flog. It's the same Greek word for both. Well, here's another coincidence. In all of Mark, only two people are scourged. Guess who? This woman and Jesus. Here's what Jesus said in 1034. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him. Same word as afflict. The same verb used of this woman in our sandwich. Jesus and the woman. She is following Jesus' model. She is the paragon of discipleship. Can I throw in one more coincidence? 525. And a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. Blood. You can guess where this is going, can't you? Yep. Only two people in Mark's gospel ever bleed. This woman and 1424. He, Jesus, said to them, this is my blood of the covenant. Only two people in Mark have blood. The rest of them are all bloodless zombies. <laughs> Only two, this woman and Jesus. Linking her to Jesus with this unique vocabulary, Mark and the Holy Spirit are telling us that this was one special woman, a true disciple following Jesus. And we too must be like her, utterly dependent on Jesus when stricken with disasters, no matter how dire the situation, no matter how hopeless the circumstance. Now, the text does not teach us that every instance of death and disease will be overcome. Well, wait a minute, there will be one day. In another day, a day of glory, then death will be vanquished and diseases will be banished forever. But the cure of disease and the defeat of death may not necessarily happen on this side of eternity. The focus of our text is rather upon the faith of the disciple in Christ's ability to handle every disastrous contingency of disease and death in life. How he will handle it, I don't know, but handle it, he will. Will you have faith when disaster strikes you or your loved ones? Will you? Mark 5, 41 and 42. And grasping the hand of the child, he said to her, Talita kum, which is translated little girl, I say to you, rise. And immediately the little girl got up. Here's another link between those two stories. Touch. Jesus touches the girl and the woman touches his garment. 
Mark 5, 25 through 27, and a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years and having suffered much under many physicians and having spent all that she had and was not being helped, but rather was becoming worse, hearing about Jesus coming in the crowd behind, touched his garment. I want you to notice how the woman is introduced. Seven clauses, participial clauses for you grammarians, and that's free, no charge for that. Seven clauses before landing on the main verb, touched. A cascade of seven items ending in touched. Let me read the text that way. Having a flow, having suffered, having spent, not being helped, becoming worse, hearing, coming. Touch. To touch a hemorrhaging woman was deemed unclean. To touch a corpse, as Jesus did later, was most certainly unclean. In other words, uncleanness was contagious. You could catch it touching the wrong things. But not so with Jesus. In his case, it was the other way around. Everything that he touched or touched him becomes clean. He touches a bleeding woman. He doesn't become unclean. She becomes healed. He touches a corpse. He doesn't become unclean. She comes back to life. Things don't work normally when Jesus touches. When he touches, there is one-way traffic from Jesus to the things he touched. People are healed, people are brought back to life. So if you are suffering today, stricken with disaster, here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to feel the touch of Christ. Would you go up to someone you trust, who cares for you, and ask for a hug? I trust you will respect pandemic preferences and maintain social propriety. But at least ask for a pat on the back. And as you go up to this friend, share with them your disaster and let them pray for you. I don't come from a hugging culture. But over the years, I've learned the value of touch as I grew as a Christian, as I learned about the skin as a dermatologist as I live life alone as a celibate. Our fellow believers are, are our interface with Christ. They are the skin of Christ we touch. And so, folks, if someone comes up to you today and asks for a hug, would you let them feel the touch of Christ? And as you give them the hug, the pat, or the high five they ask for, I want you to tell them, may you feel the touch of Christ and pray with them about the disaster they have shared. Because you see, the church, you and I, are the skin of Christ, incarnating the love of Christ. And it's through fellow believers that those stricken with disaster will feel the touch of Christ. And so let's dispense the touch of Christ to those suffering. If you are one of those suffering, Jesus cares for you daughter, son. May you feel the touch of Christ from your brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Our Father, for these powerful words and this amazing depiction of this unnamed, anonymous woman who in Mark's gospel says not even a word. We give thanks. We pray especially for those amongst us who are stricken with disaster. May they put their complete and utter trust in you and your son, Jesus Christ. May they feel the warmth of the touch of Christ through their brothers and sisters. And may we give that touch to those in affliction. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.